Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 Radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. Many of us really like to set out to travel and feel the adventure of what it's like to stretch out beyond our home and our hometown. One of the ways that we can do this, rather than jumping on a jet airliner or maybe into the recreational vehicle, is to simply go out and maybe perhaps get a cruise. One of the special ways you can do that is by going on a wonderful ship simply known as the Queen Mary II. Today we'll be talking with a cruise specialist about this wonderful ship, its rich history, and what one can possibly expect should they decide to embark on this wonderful adventure. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 Radio program today our guest, Mr. Barry Vodron. Barry, thank you for joining us here on the program today. Daniel, it truly is a pleasure to be on your show. Well, thank you very much. I think we had to broadcast the next one from the Lido deck of the Queen Mary, too. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> and that would now, be fun. Th- this is kind of an interesting topic for me because I actually grew up in Southern California, of course, in between San Pedro and Wilmington, and there were many a day that we used to love, or I used to love, when we went to the Queen Mary, which, of course, was housed there in Long Beach Harbor. And so when I heard about the Queen Mary II being built and all this, I was thinking, really? You know, and it's just, it's just fascinating to me because of the memories that it invoked of this wonderful ship that I used to enjoy touring when I was a kid. So tell us about the Queen Mary II. Is there really a relation between these two ships? Absolutely, Daniel. The the Queen Mary II, built in 1936, um, had a long legacy, a long successful history. She went through World War II. uh, And actually, Winston Churchill said that between the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth, the sister ship, those two ships shortened World War II by two years. Really? Because of the number of troops they were able to carry at one time. Oh, wow. So the the Queen Mary has a long history with the Cunard Line. It was built for the Cunard Line, Cunard White Star Line. Um, and when the ship, uh, when both the Queen Elizabeth and the Queen Mary in 1968 uh, were deemed to be too expensive to operate, there were times when she would, when both of them would be crossing the Atlantic with only a handful of passengers on board, simply because the jet age began and people were crossing the Atlantic by jet in a few hours as opposed to only a few uh, a few days. Right, right. So that ended pretty much the, the transatlantic crossing by ship as the only way to cross. And so the Queen Mary II and the Queen Elizabeth were both retired uh, because they were vastly expensive to operate. And uh, the Queen Mary made it was bought by Long Beach, and her, she was completely gutted. They removed her funnels, her boilers, or most of her engine arrangement, and she was transformed into a museum, hotel, ho- um, and uh, convention center. Mm-hmm. The Queen Elizabeth, on the other hand, her sister ship, uh, did not have that... Um, kind of a, um, didn't have that much luck uh, as the Queen Mary did. The the Queen Elizabeth ended up in uh, Fort Lauderdale, and then that went bankrupt. That um, program went bankrupt, and so she was purchased by C.Y. Tung in China and was sent to uh, Japan. And, or Hong Kong, I should say, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. And she was going to be reconverted into a floating university called the Seawise University, and she caught fire mysteriously in several places at the same time. And she gutted and tipped over, and she was a complete loss. So, yes, the Queen Mary uh, and the Queen Elizabeth, they have a very long, uh, proud history with the Cunard line. And so um, uh, since that since the Queen Mary, the QE2 came out in 1969, which was to replace both the Queen Elizabeth and the Queen Mary. And the QE2 lived a very long history, uh, made, um, was kind of the, the ultimate in transatlantic crossing at the time. Um, she is 
now retired and is sitting in Dubai. And uh, so now to carry on this legacy of a transatlantic liner, uh, Cunard Line built the Queen Mary II. And, and actually, the story is very interesting. Um, it was Mickey Arison, who is the owner of Carnival Cruise Lines, that stepped in and said, "Boy, I wish there was another transatlantic liner because the Queen Mary or the Queen Elizabeth II is is not going to last much longer uh, as a marketable ship. Sure, she's coming towards the end of her career, and he he just wished there was another liner." And uh, so that prompted him to actually purchase Cunard Line. And so that's what he did. He, he just flat out bought Cunard Line and said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to build the most amazing ocean liner the world has ever seen. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened in 2003. Uh, she went through her trials. She was built in France. And then she launched and began service in 2004. Mm-hmm as the Queen Mary too. You know, Barry, I was just thinking um, about the Queen Mary again. I haven't uh, had the opportunity to see the Queen Mary too, but I'm making a stab at the fact that they might kind of look similar. Is that true? You know, it's interesting that you say that because they, the, uh, the ship's designer, the Queen Mary II's designer, was Stephen Payne, mm -hmm. and he's an ocean liner buff like me and like many other people out there, but he's also a ship designer, an architect, and he uh, purposely built into the the, f the front end of the ship um, uh, somewhat mimicking the layout of the original Queen Mary. So there are some similarities. Um, another interesting thing that many people don't know is that the Queen Mary's middle funnel had a large whistle, steam whistle. Right. And that whistle was put in the museum, and it was there for many years in Long Beach. Well, when the Queen Mary II came out, that whistle was removed from the museum, rebuilt by the people who originally built it, and placed on the Queen Mary II next to an exact copy. So now the original Queen Mary's voice can still be heard, on the Queen Mary too. Now, I actually, if it's the same whistle I'm thinking of, uh, remember experiencing that, and you were, I really felt excited. I wonder if we're on this ship at the time that they're actually going to pull that thing, because it would just rattle and rumble your bones, that's for sure. Oh, yes. <laughs> if you're standing, you know, uh, on the bridge area of the Queen Mary, and at noon, every day at noon, they blow that right. that that ship's whistle, and it's, mm -hmm. it's loud. Yeah, no kidding. Like I said, you feel it through every uh, cell of your being. There's no doubt about that. The reason I asked about, of course, uh, the design or how the Queen Mary II looked is when I remember the Queen Mary, and I also will go back to thinking and remembering the Titanic, okay? And, uh, and the reason is, as you take a look at cruise ships today, and this is just me, and especially this one that just recently was shipwrecked, you know, capsized, whatever had happened to it, is they seem to be such monstrosities compared to what I would say these liners, such as the Queen Mary, Queen Mary II of the Titanic, they had that look of class. I mean, they were just unique. They were characters. Do you see what I mean? Well, the other ones just seem like these big, to me, ugly floating hotels. You, you, you've you nailed it exactly. Um, the ocean liners from the days of the Titanic and the Queen Mary and the SS United States um, were built as ships of state. Uh, and what I mean by that is an entire nation stood behind right. the Queen Mary, for example. A an entire nation, their hopes and dreams of the entire nation of, of England mm -hmm. stood behind this ship. And the same with the within France. Uh, the entire nation stood behind and was very proud of the Normandy, which they produced in 1934. Mm -hmm. And these ships were bigger than life, and they had that bigger-than-life look to them. Um, today, ships are not built or designed like that. They're built uh, 
to maximize the the space ratio, passenger space ratio, to be as profitable as possible. Right. And so no lo- that's why they're a little bit more boxy because um, that uh, allows for more revenue producing space. Yeah. You know, and as I said, between the two, I'd rather spend, if need be, the extra money to be on a ship that looks like lively class versus that monstrosity. <laughs> you know? yeah. I, I actually served in the Navy, so I knew what it was like to actually be on the ocean, you know, and, and to me, being on something like the Queen Mary or the Queen Mary 2 or the Titanic would certainly be my preference because it felt and looks like a real ship. You're exactly right. I mean, the the Queen Mary 2 is built very sturdy, very strong, very proud. She has um, uh, uh, two deck-high lounges, uh, which you don't see as much on cruise ships. Um, she's just, she, and she's also very smooth riding. That was one of the mm-hmm. the frustrating things that I had during this recent crossing that I did on the Queen Mary Two, um, was that the weather was so smooth and the ship kind of pedaled along at only about 20 knots. It was almost like being on a cruise um, because the ship was so smooth. But from what I have heard. Um, from people who have worked on the ship, on the Queen Mary 2, uh, they say, boy, this ship can just barrel through just about any level of seas and, and ride it like a lady. Wow. And if anybody uh, listening out there has ever crossed the Atlantic, that's saying quite a bit. I mean, that's where I was actually stationed, was on the East Coast, and I've been across the Atlantic, uh, the Atlantic Ocean a couple of times. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's that's no easy thing to do. Yeah, and people sometimes are afraid of that. They're afraid to cross the Atlantic. My wife was like that. She wasn't sure what to expect. Mm-hmm. You know, she's been on a bunch of cruises with me, and since we got married about 15 years ago, and um, you know, she's been through some rough weather. One particularly was in Norway with Hurtigruten. Uh, in the North Sea, way up in the north tip of Norway, we were in really. I mean, for me, it was rough, and and I don't get I don't get uh, seasick, but my wife was just ridiculously sick. It was horrible. I, you never want to see anybody get seasick like that. But the ship moved up and down and up at such an exaggeration. I felt like I was in a petri dish. Um, but this <laughs> ship, the Queen Mary II, is built unlike a, a battleship or a naval ship. Or She's built with a, a deep draft. She has a long, narrow hull, and, and she's truly built for a stable, solid ride. Hmm. You know, speaking of your wife, I understand that you actually have the captain officiate a wedding renewal on the Queen Mary too. Tell us about that. Yes. Um, you know what? My wife, I proposed to my wife on the Queen Mary, on the decks of the Queen Mary in Long Beach. Ah. Because I'm a big fan of the Queen Mary. In fact, the Queen Mary in Long Beach, that's what got me started in my fascination for ocean liners and cruise ships. Mm-hmm. Um, back in 1977, I went on the ship with my family, and I just got hooked. Well, in 1997, uh, I took uh, my wife, well, at that time I was dating her, I took her to the to California and we went on the Queen Mary and I took her on the typical Queen Mary tour that I used to bring my college friends on. Um, but this was a little bit different. At the end of the tour, I, I was up on the bow area and I got down on a knee and I asked her to marry me and she said yes. So that was 15 years ago. And... Recently, uh, Cunard Line changed the uh, registry of the Queen Mary II and all of the Cunard ships from Southampton to Hamilton, Mm -hmm. Bermuda. And the reason why they did that was so that they could bypass a a British law or something and now conduct weddings on their ships at sea. So now the captain can conduct uh, weddings, and wedding renewals on the Queen Mary II or any of the Cunard Line ships 
which is very unique. And so I thought I would surprise my wife and take advantage of that. So after interviewing Captain Wells, um, Christopher Wells, my wife was standing right next to me. Um, all of a sudden, I, the because I in, I videotaped these interviews, and what was really funny is I had the uh, camera focused right on my wife's face, and she saw that because I had the the um, viewer turned around, and she looked and she it, kind of stunned. Why would you do that? Like I was making a mistake, and then it then it unfolded why I did that. Um, the captain um, said we're going to renew renew your vows of 15 years. And we went through the ceremony. It was very nice. I got it all on camera. Um, but I, I thought it would have been a, a great way to complete the circle. It certainly sounds like it. <laughs> now, you became a cruise journalist, as I understand. Now, that, you know, is a fascinating way of life, especially when, you know, when people think of cruise and cruise ships it's hard to get away from the Titanic. I mean, that there is it borders on myth now, really. And when we talk about ships like the Queen Mary, and although and the Queen Mary too, that they don't have the kind of shrouded mystery, especially when it comes to the sinking of the Titanic, they certainly belong in that class anyway. Describe from your experience why that is. Well, you know, the the Titanic has the wooden decks and the wooden deck chairs, and mm -hmm. of course she was built with a grand sense of very opulent interiors. Um, the, the Titanic is just famous for the fact that she was, at the time, the largest and most luxurious ocean liner ever built. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the mystique uh, is very unique because she sank on her maiden voyage and uh, everything that could happen wrong happened that night. Um, it was, it was, you couldn't write a better novel. Um, it was just a, a very unique hmm. set of events that, that one right after another that happened that made, makes the story of the Titanic's sinking so dramatic and so fascinating with so many people and the fact that she was she was your typical ocean liner uh of that day um today when you walk aboard a ship like the queen mary or the queen mary 2 that have the the teak decks and the and the luxurious um decor and and the large ballrooms and things like that you're reminded of titanic right simply because uh, because the Titanic just um, portrayed such a element of grandeur. Mm -hmm. um, however, the the ships like the Queen Mary and the and the Queen Mary II are vastly uh, different and vastly larger than Titanic. Um, I, the Queen Mary II is three times bigger than the Titanic. Is that right? Oh yeah. Wow. Um, she, she, a lot of people don't realize. That the, the Titanic of, in 1912 at 46,000 tons, she was massive. She was the biggest man-made object. Um, but you know that was in 1912. Times have changed, and today, um, even uh, ships like the Oasis of the Seas with Royal Caribbean is like six times bigger than the Titanic. My goodness! I mean, it, it, that's how. That's to give you a good comparison of of how we've progressed. I am not going to be one to say uh, ships are not are unsinkable today, uh, as we know from the Costa Concordia incident. Ships are not unsinkable. Mm -hmm. um, and well, that particular ship, when you look at it, you kind of go, "Well, that looked like a ship that could be sunk." <laughs> <laughs> well, it just—that's the monstrosity I'm talking about. They just—they just, to me. This is my opinion. They just look stupid. I wouldn't want to take a cruise on a ship like that. Yeah, yeah the, that's just me though. They're <laughs> they're built for uh, economies of scale. Right. You know, 
sticking, you know, no more than maybe 50 miles off of a shoreline, maybe, you know, <laughs> I don't know. But I, but, but I will say that the, the incident with the cost of Concordia, in all fairness, it, it, there was a tremendous level of human error. The mm. ship actually is sound and, and sturdy, and under normal <clears throat> conditions, you, you're, you're not going to have ships like that sink. Right. But the, there was a, some stupid things that happened on the bridge that night that were human error, and that's why she that's why she foundered. Um, mm-hmm. Similar to the Titanic, there were errors made, human errors made, mm-hmm. and uh, most of the most you know when you look at most ships that sink, there there's human error involved. Um, so the, uh, that being said. Um, some of these big new cruise ships, I, they're the safest ships built mm-hmm. simply because they're built by computers. They're built with vast experience in shipbuilding that spans 200 years. Um, so they, they know how to build ships and build them safe and strong. And to the, to the novice, like many of us, these ships look top-heavy and boxy and they don't, you know, they may look like that, but they're very, very sound, mm-hmm. they're very sturdy, and they're very safe. Well, Barry, though, you do bring something up about human error, and that makes a lot of sense. Uh, first of all, talk about what, I guess, how many cruise ships there really are, you know, in the world, you know, the regularity of which these are built. And then you have to question, but how good is the training you know, for the people that get onto a ship, it's one thing to be trained, but you really need sea experience so that you could possibly avoid the kind of human errors that occurred from the sinking of the two ships that you have mentioned. Well, you're right. Um, to avoid human error, the cruise lines are stepping up their efforts to make <clears throat> sure, and they always have, but when you have an incident like this, um, there are there are elements to uh, boy. It's hard to explain this, but uh, I would say the crews, for the most part, are trained very well. The one the crew members that you want to have the best training are the officers on the bridge and the crewmen crew members that per- perform maintenance on the ship. The and, bosun mates, right? Right. <laughs> that do the maintenance on the ship, and then also those who operate the lifeboats right. should be trained in all conditions, all circumstances, and for the most part they are. Um, there were just extre- extenuating circumstances with this Concordia thing because the ship healed over so quickly, and um, thank God most people got off the ship. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were very there were few casualties. There could have been more. Um, but... I, in my opinion, and and having been on 300 cruises, wow, uh, it's a very very safe way to travel. For the most part, the crew members um, are exceptionally trained. Uh, I know when I worked on the ships, we had to stand in a straight line. Our toes had to be, you know, perfectly square. It almost like being in the military. Mm-hmm. Not all cruise ships were like this, but. On, on this one that I was on particularly, I mean, we had to dress a certain way and we had to stand in line and we had to know how to put our life jacket on and how to make it so it was tight enough and how to put life jackets on other people. Um, I think, you know, here's an element that has, th- has been thrown into the mix that I think complicates um, the issue of, of any kind of a disaster, pending disaster on a cruise ship, and that is the fact that there are so many different nationalities represented now on cruise ships mm-hmm. as in the crew. The, the crew are international and come from all over the world. And most of the crew members, depending on where the ship is based, need to speak English. But they don't always um, speak the best English. And... You know, when a ship is it has an accident like this, it's hard to, and you have that many people from around the world with different nationalities. Um, communication is is a challenge, and especially when there's the adrenaline and excitement and 
and danger and and people are scared, even the crew members, it's good to have people that speak English or speak the language and, and are kind of work as one and know their training, whether the ship is listing heavily or not. Um, so I, I believe that the cruise industry is, is extremely safe. And for the most part, these crew members are trained very, very well. Because every week there's a drill. And mm -hmm. so they're trained very well. Well, the other thing, too, if the brakes go out on the ship, you're right there on the ocean versus 18,000 feet above. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now, on the Queen Mary 2, tell us about the transatlantic uh, crossing uh, of this ship and what makes that so special. Well, there's such a long legacy in the history of crossing the Atlantic by ship. And mm -hmm. the Queen Mary 2 is the ship that now makes this journey on a regular basis, and and she does it in style. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, there is, for those people out there who have traveled the world, who have been there, done that, and they haven't crossed the Atlantic on an ocean liner, they're really missing out on a culture that's very, very unique, uh, a culture and a legacy of history. Mm -hmm. um, because in the old days of where, where truck crossing the Atlantic was the only way to get across the Atlantic was by ship, um, there was a camaraderie on board, and uh, and there was a pride about being on these ships. Um, but they were used as transportation. Today, uh, the Queen Mary II is no longer used primarily as transportation, but most uh, it's it's used to as as a leisure as a vacation. Mm -hmm. But there still are some people who use the Queen Mary II as transportation to get from one side of the Atlantic to the other. For example, there's a I don't I, I remember when I worked on the Kiwi two there was a rock group called the Cure and they refused to fly at all costs. Mm -hmm. And so every time they had to go across the Atlantic they would go on the ship. There are still a lot of people who are afraid to fly or who don't who choose not to fly that still cross on the Atlantic um, by ship. Also, if you're going to bring your pet across the Atlantic, you can do that on the Queen Mary too. Um, on our crossing, there were six dogs and six cats and uh, in the kennel on the ship, and these these animals would be brought out on deck to run and play, and it was really fun to watch that. Mm -hmm. I know, Barry, you bring something up. To, I remember uh, some time ago I was talking with some friends and we talked about places like going to Hawaii and Australia, and I said, when the time comes that I go there, I'd prefer to take a cruise to these places than fly. And they said, well, what for? And I said, because I really honestly don't want to spend 18 hours on a plane. They said, well, you know, those other ones are going to take a few days. I'd rather just get there so you can go and enjoy it. And I said, you know, the thing about it is, is on a cruise, is you get to a point where you anticipate getting there, but you're extremely relaxed while you're doing it. A plane, you're just aggravated. You just want to get off the dadgum thing. And to me, if I was going to go on these longer trips, that would, you know, taking a cruise to me, would be my preferred way to go. Would that be something you would agree with? Oh, absolutely. And, that, and that I mean, there are a huge bunch of advantages I can think of besides it's going to take you a couple of extra days to get there. And to me, that's not really a disadvantage, especially if anyone's ever really been on the ocean, because that's, well, anyway, I'll let you take it from there. Well, yeah, absolutely. The, to cross on the Queen Mary to across the Atlantic, one of the interesting things that they've tried they tried on on our crossing is that they've changed the the time that they they forward the clocks. Um, so every day you uh, they turn the clock back, so you you lose it you lose an hour. Mm -hmm. And so when when you once you get like from for example, when we left from New York or Brooklyn area, once you get to Southampton, you're acclimated to the time already, because every day slowly they changed the hour, and so you you feel refreshed, you're acclimated to the time. In fact, this was something that I just a, a phenomenon that I thought was fascinating or a fact is that 
before the days of uh, air uh, jets crossing the Atlantic, no one ever experienced jet lag. Right. Think about it. Jet lag was a very was only for fighter pilots that zoomed you know over the skies, and even then, you know, there was very few people that experienced it. But today, you know, when you fly across the Atlantic in eight hours, there's a dramatic difference in in time, and your body kind of has is confused and has to adjust to that. Well, when you're on the, on a crossing on a liner like the Queen Mary two, you you don't experience that jarring time uh, issue. Mm-hmm. You're acclimated when you get to the place that you're going. Yeah, you're refreshed. You're ready to go. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so forget it. You know, like I said, my argument was I don't care if it takes me a couple of extra days to get there. You know, the cruise is part of the vacation. Yeah, it's just the, that's just the way it is. And I just really don't want to spend 18 hours on a plane getting somewhere. <laughs> well, one of the things that people also say, uh, they have objections about going across the Atlantic by ship, is that they think they'd be bored. You know, spending seven days going across the Atlantic without, go- without going or stopping at any port sounds mm-hmm. extremely boring. But And my wife even thought of that in her head. She thought, you mean, she, she thought to herself, she thought, we're... I mean, we're going across the Atlantic, and we're not stopping anywhere. Uh, I, what are we going to do? But the Queen Mary II is built in with so many activities. She has the only planetarium on a ship anywhere. Uh, that she has uh, fantastic shows and, and top-notch lectures. And, of course, the dining is, is some of the best at sea. Mm-hmm. So there, I... I thought it was a relaxing time, even though I was running around doing my business as a journalist. Uh, my wife took a number of naps during the day, uh, during the sea days. And, and even though she drank a lot of iced tea, which had a lot of caffeine, she was still able to take naps. Because <laughs> there's something about being at sea on a ship like this that was is, is, is so relaxing. It really is. For mm-hmm. somebody that needs relaxation, that their doctor says, look, you need to get away. You need to relax. Mm-hmm. Well, a transatlantic crossing will relax anybody. Oh, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And the other thing, too, is you consider what happens at night. You know, and I had experienced for myself uh, as you're out at sea at night, you know, the sea is a very humbling place because there is literally a feeling of nothing else out there, that you are really alone. And even on a ship when you're with a few hundred people, there's still that feeling that you're alone. And there were just moments, especially in the night sky, where the stars felt like you could really reach up and pluck them right out of the sky. It was just quite amazing. So like you said, it's not boring like people would think it is. No, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Um, it's an experience that every I wish everybody would take because it 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 uh, it has so much history to it, and there's a sense of accomplishment when you go on a cruise in the Caribbean. Your sense of accomplishment was, okay, I did it. I went on vacation. Well, when you're on a crossing on the Queen Mary Two, your sense of accomplishment is not only did I have a great relaxing vacation. But I did something that has meaning and value, and, and it has historical significance. Mm-hmm. And and you feel that when you're crossing the Atlantic on on this ship. Now, when as the listeners are listening to the program and they think, you know, this Queen Mary two sounds pretty good. How do they go about approaching this? You know, especially in economic times, for the best deals and so forth. How would you recommend somebody approach something like this? Well, my my experience is to um, to find dates that are. Um, it, it depends on the season that you want to go. If you kind of go across the Atlantic on an off, a little bit of an off season, you're probably going to get a little bit better rates. So so take advantage of the the seasonal discounts there are. 
But secondly, don't go to ABC Travel down the road or don't go to you know your typical travel agency online uh, or, or that travel agent friend of yours. Um, don't do that. Go to a large cruise agency uh, that, does, that does a tremendous volume in cruises because they're able to get the best upgrades, discounts, amenities, um, you know they're they're able to treat you better now. Even take that a step further. Go to a specialist that specializes in luxury travel. Um, for example, I work a lot with um, Luxury Only at LuxuryOnly.com. Okay. They're not only the largest retailer of cruises. They're they're part of um, World Travel Holdings. They're the largest retailer of cruises anywhere. But they're very specialized uh, at luxury only. They um, focus and specialize in luxury products like the Queen Mary II and Cunard Line and many of the other uh, five, six, seven star cruise ships. Mm -hmm. um, they have a concierge that takes care of all of your needs for you. Does, and that doesn't mean you're going to spend more. You're actually going to save money when you talk with an agency that specializes in the, in what in luxury travel because they know that industry so well and they do enough volume where the cruise lines give them perks and upgrades and amenities that aren't offered by ABC Travel down the street that doesn't may, maybe sells one uh, luxury cruise a year, you know, something like that. So that's my advice is to, is to go to a, a very, very large company that, that specializes in luxury travel, luxury cruises. Mm. Well, and, and the thing that you, you just pointed out, too, for the listeners out there, Barry, is that going to a specialist, as you're talking about, saving money is important, obviously, but what's even more important is you're not doing a cruise every month or every year, so you really can customize the experience for you. And it sounds to me like this particular website or that particular uh, business entity that's what they specialize in. Yeah, they specialize in that, they, and they have concierge mm -hmm. that take care of. See, one of the things that I've noticed is that people that have the kind of money to go on a transatlantic crossing in some of the upper categories, they don't. They really saving money. They don't even. Many times they don't even think about it. They just book it. Right. Uh, or they have they have somebody else book it for them. So price isn't necessarily the issue, it's service. They want service. They don't want to worry. They don't want to worry about this or that. They just want it done. Just do it. And right. do it well. And and that's why going to a specialist like Cruises Only or Luxury Only, you're going to get the best uh, service available because that's all they do. Mm -hmm. Now, about the rooms, uh, tell me a little bit about that uh, and your experience uh, and the reason I bring this up, it's kind of maybe a little bit off, but I remember I was watching on a television talk show program. Uh, there was a travel specialist, and he was talking about staying in hotels. And he says, what you want to do is you want to get a hold of the boiler technician of the hotel to find out what floor is the boilers on. You know, that way you can get a room that's relatively close to that because you get the best water pressure and the most heat you're showered, I thought, well, you know, that's a pretty important thing you wouldn't have thought of. <laughs> but tell us, you know, how would you go about that on something like a ship? And do these uh, places that you recommend people go to, can they help you kind of, again, customize that experience if that's something that's important to you? Well, yeah, some of the things, when you go to an expert company that books luxury cruises like this often, they know uh uh, elevators are, the elevator bays are, they know about the deck above if there's a piano bar and that if that translates, if that noise can be heard. I mean, they, they know these <laughs> or, rooms. Or, or should you get stuck next door to where the karaoke bar is? <laughs> right, right. I mean, that, things like that can be a, a little annoying. How close um, could I be to when the dessert is served, you know? <laughs> right, right. Or which room is closest to the food. Right, know? exactly. Well, the Queen Mary II is broken up into into three basic categories mm -hmm. uh, as far as accommodations. 
there's the Britannia restaurant category, and that's where the masses are. Mm-hmm. That's uh, and and if you're wanting to just get on the ship, and you 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 you're on a budget, then get in the Britannia restaurant class, um, or category. Then if you want to up uh, upgrade a bit, then get into Princess Grill or Queen's Grill. Now, um, the Queen's Grill, for example, uh, has some of the most lavish apartment complexes at sea. And they're two-level, massive uh, apartments. Wow. Ship. They have sweeping staircase to go up to the next level. They have, a bu- they have butler service. They have private uh, a private uh, kitchen or galley for the butler to come in and, and fix whatever you want. In fact, just a couple of weeks before we were on board the Queen Mary II, uh, President H.W. Uh, Bush had, and, and his wife were on that crossing. And they stayed in these suites um, and had, uh, I think there were eight Secret Service men that traveled with them on this crossing. But that was another thing about the Queen Mary too, is that you, you're going to have all the privacy that you want as well. Wow. And uh, the, the of course, the dining is, is just, it's the best at sea. Anything you want, you, they, will, they will make it for you. But mm. I'll give you an example. Um, my wife and I traveled in, in the Princess Grill, which is, is uh, comparable to Queen's Grill. It's a step below the Queen's Grill, but they're, they're still very close. Um, and my wife likes to have sweet tea, which is unique. Um, she's kind of a southern lady, southern gal, and likes the sweet tea. And they don't make sweet tea on the ships like she likes it. So the very first evening at dinner in the Princess Grill, I told our waiter, I said, my wife likes to have sweet tea, and she likes it a certain way. Can you make it? And he says, oh, we'll do everything we can to make it just the way she wants it, and then we'll bring it to you every meal. Mm-hmm. And they, what they did was they, for just for her, they specially brewed iced tea and sweetened it just the way she wanted it for every meal. So she didn't even have to, have to ask for it. They just It was just there right. for every meal. And that really made her smile, my wife smile, and she enjoyed that. Sounds like so much fun, too. You know, again, like you said, it's not just about the saving the money. I think, uh, again, that's something that can be important, but when it comes to cruises, it's kind of something you set aside because, again, it's about the experience. Absolutely. The, the experience, being able to spend time together, if you're with your your mate to be able to spend quality time together and and get the rest and naps that you miss when you're mm-hmm. in your normal life and just to enjoy the shows and the the great dining and the service the level of service and to come into your little sanctuary suite mm-hmm. your suite is kind of a sanctuary of comfort mm-hmm. and just to you know one night what we threw open our uh, veranda door and and listened to the ocean all night long and wow I mean you can't get much better than that as far as relaxation and soothing uh, sounds that the ocean makes the salt sea breeze that you experience um, one thing about a crossing or any or even a cruise is the ocean air has I believe it has healing elements to it it's that salt air. It, it invigorates. It, it invigorates the body, and um, so that's why it was so relaxing to have that door of our suite open to the uh, the balcony suite open all night long. Mm-hmm. Now I'm thinking that it was probably the television show, The Love Boat, that probably inspired you to become a cruise journalist. Um. No. You know. <laughs> Thought I'd take a shot. Yeah, that was a good shot. But um, no, what it, actually, I started a talk show very similar to what you're doing. Um, a friend of mine uh, from college, he had a talk show, a podcast, and he invited me to be on his show just to talk about college days. 
and I saw how it was done and uh, how much fun it was, and I thought, you know, I'm going to give it a try. So I decided to start a little talk show, and and what I did was I thought to myself, um, if I were listening, who would I want to listen to being interviewed? Mm-hmm. And so I wrote out a list of of a, a lot of people that I thought were um, fascinating to, to listen to and interview, and I contacted them, and all of them agreed. And uh, and my first real strong interview with was with Mr. John Maxtone Graham, who wrote the Bible of the transatlantic history called The Only Way to Cross. And he has such an elegant way of talking when you when you speak to him. And I talked with him for an hour on my talk show, and that is what launched my show, is that interview. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a void in podcast land uh, for people talking about cruise ships and ocean liners and history and whatever. And, and so I, I'm not going to say I was the first, but because um, I don't know. But I know that a lot of people that have started up uh, talk shows and cruise-related podcasts, they call me and say, hey, I, I listened to yours and I loved it and that's why I wanted to start doing this. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what got me started about four or about five years ago. And then I started um, talking with some of the cruise line executives and I was offered a trip to, to uh, talk about that particular cruise line. And I thought, hmm, there really is something interesting to this lifestyle, if I can duplicate this, um, I could spend a lot of time at sea. And so that's what I did. I just embarked on that journey, uh, setting up interviews and setting up uh, shows that that were like virtual cruises. I'd bring my little microphone with me and I'd record sounds of the ship and, and interview the captain and the cruise director and while I'm on the cruise. And my listeners really enjoyed that, and they loved hearing the sounds that mm-hmm. you would hear during a cruise. And uh, that's what launched my passion and interest in becoming a cruise journalist. Ah. Um, but they, it, so it was about five years ago. Uh, that doesn't mean that um, being a cruise journalist is all fun and games and all rosy and happy. It's it, There are some challenges to being a cruise journalist. Um, I, I'm married and I have an 11 year old son and he's in school so when you're gone too much then that can be a challenge. So I try to balance it so that I bring my wife or bring my son with me as much as I can um, and and also trying to monetize uh, these shows that I do. That's another challenge. Um, because two years ago I went into this full-time. I left the work that I was doing and went into this full-time and didn't realize it would take so long <laughs> to be able to monetize it to replace my income. I'm still not quite there yet. But I know a lot of people, when they think of broadcasting, we've been broadcasting our show for eight years and have actually been on terrestrial radio stations, and we'll find ourselves actually back in that realm as we're working on that. But... You know, they instantly think that, you know, that seems like so much fun, which it is. And they think of all this big money, but that takes it takes a long time to do that. And the reason is you got to find a specialty, you know, something that you're really good at broadcasting. And the other thing is something that people re- really want to listen to, you know. Yeah. And, <clears throat> you know, you've certainly found your niche. The beauty of our show, you know, obviously beyond 50 people think, well, you know, I kind of get that. And so really, you know, what's this about? We describe, well, it's a variety talk show magazine is what it is. Sure. And we and travel just happens to be one of those things we cover. Uh, what I take pride in our broadcast when it comes to the travel segment is to me that we cover it very uniquely compared to most programs that are on any type of media, whether it's Oprah Winfrey or any of them. And, uh, for instance, uh, we had done one on, uh, on uh, taking vacations in hot spots around the world. Like, for instance, who would think about taking, for instance, a vacation in Iraq? 
<laughs> you know, but we actually talked with somebody who was a specialist and said, hey, you know, it could be a little risky, it could be a little bit dangerous, but where are you going to stay in a four-star hotel for $20 a night? Exactly. And be in the middle of the mix. Kind of exciting. <laughs> well, one of the most exotic places that, as a cruise journalist, I was able to go to was Dubai. Mm-hmm. Uh, in January, I went to Dubai, which was truly fascinating. And I stayed in, in the world's most luxurious hotel uh, called Burj Al Arab. It's the, the hotel that looks like a big sail ah. in Dubai. And I stayed in a suite that was larger than my entire, entire apartment building here. I mean, mm-hmm. it was two stories with a butler, and if you were to pay to stay there, it would be about $6,000 a night. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, uh, that was fascinating. Uh, there are so many interesting hot spots around the world that I still want to go to. Mm-hmm. Now, on the Queen Mary II, you know, which is obviously the topic of our discussion, you talked about an international crew. And I remember there was some years ago before I decided to pursue broadcasting, which has always been my lifelong passion, is that that was an area that I thought about pursuing because I was in the service industry. And I remember I was talking with my father about it and some other people, and they said, well, you know, you're an American. You might find it hard going to get into the area of cruise lines because I thought, as I was in uh, the Navy, that that would be kind of an enjoyable way to go and become, you know, to work in service uh, for these ships. But They said they kind of tend to steer, at least in his experience, away from that because really especially American people really don't want to take a cruise to be served by other Americans. They really want to get away and be in another world, so to speak. And you did describe that earlier in the program. Is that true? You know, it's really interesting that you bring that up, but um, the one of the things is that the service industry on a cruise ship is so demanding oh, that's, that, yeah. frankly, Americans don't want to work that hard. And it's it's sad <laughs> to say that. I'm sorry to say that. But no, there's a lot of truth in what you're saying, too, Americans believe me. Americans <laughs> just don't want to work the hours mm-hmm. that a typical service oriented uh, crew member on a cruise ship works. Um, On the other hand, um, uh, most of the jobs that that, um, Americans take on cruise ships are in the entertainment field, like a crew staff, cruise director, um, dancers, um, entertainment. Mm -hmm. Um, Those are the jobs that most of the Americans like to take. but but changing beds in, in the staterooms every day or doing the dishes or working in the galley or, or being a waiter is incredibly hard work. It's in, I, would, I personally <laughs> would not want to do it. They work so hard. They work, I mean, you, you just wonder how they can do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's one of the reasons why you don't see as many Americans working on the, the ships. But also, it's it's a very competitive industry. You know, there's a lot of people that want to that think it would be romantic to work on a cruise ship, and they try, they send their resume out. But few people are cut out for that lifestyle, living on a ship, cooped up with, you know, all these other crew members working long hours, mm-hmm. and it's a completely different lifestyle that most people. They think in their mind, oh, yeah, I could do that, but until they actually do it, um, it's, that, that changes things. Well, I think, Barry, as they get, like you said, that romantic notion, they're going to be lounging around in the off hours, mixing it with the crew, but that's not at all the way it really is. Yeah, usually they're so tired they spend that time in their, <laughs> in their, in their little tiny cabin sleeping. Right, right. Um, and and a lot of drinking, a lot of alcohol happens. Oh, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Fascinating stuff. It's been a pleasure to have you here on the program, especially talking about, again, something like the Queen Mary II. As I said, it was in the early 1970s that I used to love going and taking, you know, going on the Queen Mary tour. And 
even though it seemed to be the same, there was just something I always enjoyed about that, and to see that there's actually a Queen Mary two now, and that you can actually go on this ship and enjoy a cruise, especially, as you said, the transatlantic, which I've done as well, it really, truly is an experience that's more than worth doing and putting on your bucket list. Now, Barry, again, go ahead and give out those websites or website or websites where people can pursue this as, as something that they want to do. Well, Daniel, thanks for that opportunity. If you want, uh, if your listeners want to follow me and what I do, they can go to cruisetalkshow.com mm -hmm. or specifically with the Queen Mary 2 voyage, they can go to thecruisejournalist.com. And that will take them directly to uh, the pages and videos and com uh, uh, content related to this Queen Mary 2 crossing. Mm -hmm. um, and then to save money on your next cr crossing or if you want to go on the Queen Mary tour on a luxury vacation, I, I personally would recommend uh, Luxury Only. Okay. Um, and it's LuxuryOnly.com. And they'll be able to. They'll get treated um, really, really well. Yeah, and I noticed that on your uh, your website, CruiseTalkShow.com, there's actually a banner to the right on luxury only. So that's pretty easy for people to get to. Yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. Very good. Well, Barry, again, thank you for joining us here on the program. It was, you know, something like this is always enjoyable to talk about. Yeah, I enjoyed it. It was fun to. I always like to talk about ships, and the Queen Mary Two is a very special ship to me. So. Thanks and for it's, the opportunity. And it's exciting to talk with someone who has something they're passionate about as well. Barry, again, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Thank you, Daniel. want to thank you, the listeners out there. Just to give you that website one more time, it's cruisetalkshow.com, where you can find out more about this so you can plan your next adventure and don't take too long doing it. Also, as you're adventuring across the Internet, be sure to adventure into beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We do have a free weekly e-newsletter as well as a blog where we're going to post an archive of this particular show so you can listen at your convenience and share with others as well. I'm Daniel Davis. Again, thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio Show. And remember, live your day past halfway.